<laughs> Holmes and Watson are right on schedule. Their train is due to pass the foot of the tower at high noon. Since this is the highest tower in the world, over 1,800 feet tall, it will take quite a long time for the bomb to reach the ground. But I'll only need five seconds to jump clear of the tower with my parachute. So I'll give gravity a little help with my special automatic bomb accelerator. If I want the bomb to reach the ground in exactly five seconds, I must give it an initial velocity of, hmm, let me see, 4.4 uh, feet per second. And this time it will really be, uh, goodbye, Holmes, uh, goodbye, Watson. <laughs> just look at that tower, Holmes. Oh, what a magnificent structure. And it's just coming up to five seconds before 12 o'clock. We're dead on time. Ah, that's just what Moriarty hopes. What? <laughs> oh my goodness, Moriarty's got a bomb. Bombs away! <laughs> Jump home! Relax, my dear Watson. We'll be well clear of the tower before the bomb hits the ground. You see? But, but how could you be so sure the bomb would arrive too late? Because I'm quite certain Moriarty didn't give the bomb enough initial velocity to reach the ground in five seconds. Well, you mean he got his algebra wrong again? You're learning, Watson. You're learning. Welcome to the Power of Algebra, Program 3. First, a recap of the previous program. It was about the rules for the order of operations. Do multiplication and division before addition and subtraction. Do the operations inside grouping symbols before multiplication and division. Do the exponential operations before the operations inside grouping symbols. Three simple rules that have to be followed. In this program, we're going to look at other ways of simplifying algebraic problems. We're going to look at the basic properties of numbers. Now, this office tower is a property. It's something you own. But not all properties are made of bricks and mortar. A property can also be an ability that you have. For example, human beings have the ability to talk. That's one of the properties of being human. I guess we could call it a talkative property. The numbers and the letters that stand for numbers in algebra have properties, too. The first property that numbers and algebraic symbols have is they can move around. Or rather, you can move them around. If you do have to add 6 and 3, for instance, you can write 6 plus 3 or 3 plus 6. Either way, the answer is 9. In other words, 6 plus 3 equals 3 plus 6. The same goes for letters that stand for numbers in algebra. A plus B equals B plus A. Not only can you move numbers and letters around in addition problems, you can also move them around in multiplication problems. 6 times 3 or 3 times 6, both equal 18. You can prove this is true if you think in terms of real objects, three groups of six hamburgers. It's the same number of hamburgers as six groups of three hamburgers. If six times three equals three times six, then A times B equals B times A, or AB equals BA. Since this ability of numbers and letters to move around in addition and multiplication problems is a bit like people commuting to and from work, it's called the commutative property of addition and the commutative property of multiplication. That can be summed up as A plus B equals B plus A and AB equals BA. But be careful. The commutative property only applies to addition and multiplication. It does not apply to subtraction or division. 6 minus 3 does not equal 3 minus 6, any more than 6 divided by 3 equals 3 divided by 6. In algebra, just as in math in general, only adders and multipliers commute. Subtractors and dividers have to stay at home. Structural engineer is sort of like an orthopedic surgeon. He's the seller that handles what makes something stand up. Every building has to have something to hold it up. Now, that building can be designed out of concrete, it can be designed out of steel, or it can be designed out of timber. 
you have uh, people that are going to occupy it, and you may have an assembly area where you've got a, a rock concert. Well, they're going to shake that building good. So uh, you've got to have someone that can decide what it's going to take to keep that building up. And that's what we do. In an office building, we may have to use uh, 80 pounds a square foot to take care of the equipment, or desks, the people that are going to walk in it. So to do all of this, you have to have a good mathematical background. Now, that starts back with one and one is two. Then you go into your multiplication tables. Then you get up into algebra. All right, after algebra, you've got trigonometry. Well, after that, you've got calculus. Then analytics and the engineering uh, uh, studies such as uh, statics and dynamics. And all of this goes in to everything we do every day. We use every bit of it. And if you miss one phase of it, you just can't ever fill that gap. So you have to go from the first all the way through. And if you're weak uh, in your mu uh, ma uh, multiplication tables, by the time you get into algebra, you're going to be lost because you've missed that one tool. And each one is a tool, and you keep progressing through the whole thing. So by the time we get through all of our math courses, we take all of these areas and apply them to a particular job. Like if we're going to design the columns on a building, we have certain formulas that we use, and we have to be able to take all of this and put it together and come up with something that'll give us a, the stress and the strain that's going to go on that member. All of this goes into setting up, getting up a set of plans. So what we do, we'll draw as a structural engineer the foundation plans, the floor plans. We'll indicate all of the column sizes, the beam sizes, Everything that goes into making that skeleton of that building stand up, then these plans are given to the architect, and he combines them with his architectural plans. And of course, they're combined with the mechanical plans and electrical plans. Again, you go right back to your basics, your mathematics, algebra, trig, calculus, analytics. It's all there, and you use it every day. So if you lose it somewhere along the way, you'll never catch up. They say that two's company and three's a crowd because it's much easier for two people to get along together than three. I can either work with him or with him. I can't work with the both of them at the same time. Three's a crowd in math and algebra as well. You can only work with two numbers or letters at a time. I can't add these three numbers simultaneously. I either add five and four, then three, or four and three, then five or shift the whole thing around and add three and five and then four. Whichever way I do it, the answer is the same. So I can add numbers in any order I like. I can also multiply them in any order. I can either start with five times four or four times three or three times five. Again, whichever way I do it, the answer is the same. Just as in ordinary life, I can associate with anyone I like, with him or with him, when I do addition or multiplication, I can associate any two numbers together. It's called the associative property of addition and the associative property of multiplication, which can be summed up as a plus b plus c equals a plus b plus c, and a times b times c equals a times b times c. But again, be careful. Like the commutative property, the associative property only applies to addition and multiplication. You certainly can't do your subtractions and divisions in any order you like, or else you'll be in a real mess. Well, I've commuted to work and associated with my fellow workers. It's time to distribute the mail. Got two piles, three for my boss and two for the secretary in this pile, and the same in this pile. Two times three plus two, which is two times five, which equals 10. But when I come to distribute these letters, I'll actually distribute two sets of three letters to the boss and two sets of two letters to the secretary. That's two times three plus two times two, which is six plus four, which also equals 10. Just as we could say that 
I'm distributive with respect to these letters. In math, we can say that multiplication is distributive with respect to addition. Which is why the fact that 2 times 3 plus 2 equals 2 times 3 plus 2 times 2 is called the distributive property of multiplication with respect to addition. Because the multiplying number can be distributed over the numbers to be added. This can be summed up as a times b plus c equals a times b plus a times c. Once you know these basic properties of the number system, commutative, associative, and distributive, you can rearrange algebraic equations to make them easier to solve. If only Moriarty had known this, his bomb might have arrived on time. I, I, I know I'm learning algebra, Holmes, but I still don't see where Moriarty went wrong, because he learned his algebra only too well. No? How is that, Holmes? Remember the formula for propelling an object downwards? Oh, yes. Uh, H for height equals T for time, uh, multiplied by R for rate, or initial velocity, plus G over 2 uh, for half the pull of gravity, uh, multiplied by T again. Excellent, Watson. Uh, thank you. Uh, we know that the height of the tower is approximately 1,800 feet, and that the pull of gravity is 32 feet per second, so we halve that to 16. And, and we also know that the time Moriarty wanted the bomb to take to reach the ground is five seconds, so we put that in twice, eh? Now, the, the only thing we don't know is R, the initial velocity Moriarty should have given to the bomb. Uh, I say, but all this looks jolly complicated. So, Watson, how can we rearrange the equation to make it easier to solve? Oh, the distributive property, of course. Well, we can rewrite 5 times R plus 16 times 5 as 5 times R plus 5 times 16 times 5 which gives us 5 times r plus 400. We then subtract 400 from both sides to get 1400 equals 5r. Oh, and, and then we divide both sides by 5, huh? To get 280 equals r, or, or rather, r equals 280. Very good indeed. So, in order for his bomb to reach the ground in 5 seconds, Moriarty should have given it an initial velocity of 280 feet per second. But he obviously didn't, otherwise we, we wouldn't be alive to tell the tale. <laughs> but why didn't he? Because, as I told you, Watson, he learned his lesson on our last adventure only too well. You mean the order of operations? Yes, indeed. Moriarty was so anxious to do the operations inside the grouping symbols before anything else that he made the mistake of adding unlike terms. He must have added 16 times 5, which is 80, and R, which he took as 1R, to make 81R. Oh, I see. And then he would have multiplied that by 5 to get 405R, and then divided both sides by 405 to give us an R value of 4.4 feet per second. Oh, no wonder his bomb arrived too late. Uh, of course, I was certain he hadn't yet learned about the distributive property. But it's only to be expected. Poor old Moriarty is always one step behind me. Hmm? He's probably trying to follow us now. Oh, good Lord! Uh, but he'll never catch up with me. Hmm? Uh, Holmes, look out! Oh, I'm much too quick for that. <laughs> <laughs>